Uh, hi. Uh, so today we will uh, talk about OpenGL uh, to implement uh, graphics programs. Uh, so it's a graphics library that is very popular. Uh, so we will focus on that uh, today. Uh, and this is also a good timing uh, because I have uh, shared the homework with you recently and it includes some open GL programming. Uh, so that's why you should be able to take this class first before attacking the homework. As you can see here, uh, OpenGL program, uh, and we will do modeling transformations, which is already covered. Uh, there are translations, rotations, scaling, reflection, etc. Uh, and it will be implemented uh, on both CPU and GPU. For the second part, you will be using some shading language, GLSM. Uh, and for the first part, CPU. Uh, we will directly use OpenGL uh, functions. Uh, okay, so this is a very short intro about the homework. Now let's start the real business, uh, which would be uh, OpenGL and also some GPU pipeline, graphics hardware. We will talk about that first, actually. Uh, uh, yeah, so... And there is also another thing. Uh, okay, so uh, I, the thing I want to mention is I uh, skipped the uh, rasterization class as well as the clipping and culling classes to come directly into the OpenGL business and after we cover this, we will return to the rasterization algorithms. So we haven't really studied them. I am aware of that. So just a quick note about that. Uh, so it is written also in the first sentence here, we focused on graphic algorithms rather than the implementation details, but there is some uh, thing missing here in the algorithms department. I haven't shown you rasterization algorithms or culling and clipping algorithms. So it will not affect your homework situation or the understanding of the current OpenGL class today. Uh, that's why I just pushed this earlier and I will return to those graphics algorithms later. Uh, but other than that, we have covered ray tracing algorithms, uh, model, modeling transformation, algorithms, viewing transformations, and lots of graphics algorithms are already covered. Uh, so the graphics without a specialized tool or hardware would be too slow for most applications because the scene data is very dense. Uh, we have uh, a lot of vertices to process, uh, points to process. So uh, that's why we, need some uh, implementation details and tricks. And that would be the topic of today. Uh, and the graphics processing unit will also help uh, the hardware aspect of today's discussion. Uh, so we will see how GPU works and how to program it using uh, an API. I will prefer OpenGL as with the most of the graphics community. There is an alternative called Direct3D from uh, Microsoft, uh, which is still uh, in use, uh, but we will go with the OpenGL uh, API. So the graphics uh, hardware is essentially uh, a set of components that implements the forward rendering pipeline. So be careful here. We have seen two rendering pipelines, forward and backward. Backward being the ray tracing pipeline, where we send rays from the eye camera to the scene and do some intersection calculations. Uh, so the GPUs are not designed 
for that, at least originally. Currently, we also see extensions to the to that pipeline. But for the sake of our discussion here, we don't do uh, backward rendering. The forward rendering is more popular, and it is very natural uh, with the GPU because in the forward pipeline, we have the scene data and we project it uh, to the viewport and then we uh, render it. We fill the in-betweens, uh, the fragments, making up the scene elements like triangles, etc. Uh, so they can be done in parallel and uh, GPUs are designed for that. Uh, they are programmable uh, and massively parallel. And the idea and intuition about parallelism is that uh, most of the actions we do in graphics are independent. Like you have this transformation, you want to rotate the object, so you will apply the same rotation matrix to all the vertices. Uh, like if you have 1 million vertices, you, you will do that the same action 1 million times in a sequential manner. You don't have to do that, you can just do it in parallel. Uh, similarly, for rendering, uh, to render a pic pixel to select a good color for that, uh, you find the corresponding 3D point and make some color calculations there, which is independent from the calculations of the other points, or points colors. Uh, so it is also parallel. So GPU exploits this fact, essentially. And the big players are AMD, NVIDIA, probably NVIDIA is the biggest, Intel, Microsoft, Apple, Qualcomm. We see <clears throat> actions from those giants. And <clears throat> here, uh, I want to uh, show the uh, GPU versus CPU demo. Uh, in this YouTube video, actually, you can also find it online, but I, we, are, we just put it here. So here, what they do is, this is the CPU version, if I recall correctly. It colors each pixel sequentially, like it started. Although they are independent, it doesn't uh, utilize this fact. So even if you use a faster G, a CPU, it will be like uh, not, not that fast and the output is not even that uh, impressive. And here with a GPU-based solution, what we observe is uh, we use this independence and parallelism. So each, uh, so this is, and we are not talking about threat level illusion of parallelism you can achieve using CPUs. We are talking about explicit parallel hardware that are that, that is embedded in GPU, like these cables here. Uh, so we have an explicit parallelism. And as you can see, you get that picture, a, a, a better version of it. Well, it is not the point actually here. The point is the speed. Yeah, so let's see that again. Yeah, so those colors just make up the scene fast, uh, in a more uh, fast manner. And this was from 2008. Uh, so the parallelism doesn't only apply to computer graphics, obviously. It can be, so this idea, the parallel a massive parallel architecture of GPUs can be used in other applications. So we indeed call it GPGPU, general purpose computing on GPU. And a specific language to do that is C CUDA, uh, and OpenCL is another. Uh, so <clears throat> many computational intensive tasks that are, uh, that have tendency to be parallel to be independent uh, are implemented per front on GPU. Uh, and so these are not just image processing and video processing or graphics.
text processing. They can be in B informatics, some other optimizations, uh, machine learning, etc. So let's see the GPU architecture. Uh, we have actually it looks like the CPU architecture. The terms we see here are very familiar to us, like registers that keep the current calculations, uh, ALU units, arithmetic logic units, uh, cache, the faster memory that is closer to the processing unit, uh, and memory is a larger area than the cache, but it is slightly um, slower than the cache since it is physically farther away from the processing unit, but still memory is a fast medium compared to the hard disks. Uh, so we don't have any hard disk obviously in GPU. Uh, we also have some logic to decode instructions to perform. Uh, so these are CPU friendly familiar parts and uh, we talk about parallelism here. Uh, and what makes GPUs parallel? Uh, this seemed architecture makes it parallel, which is called single instruction, multiple data. So you have uh, an instruction like rotate and you apply it to multiple data, like multiple vertices. Uh, or here in this case, the instruction would be just divide by two and it is applied to multiple data leading to multiple outputs. Uh, they, they are different, but after all, the operation is the same. So this works well for independent tasks, for transforming vertices like the rotation example I have been talking about, or also for color computations, for shading of each fragment of a scene element, like a triangle or a quad. Uh, so compare GPU with CPU, here you see an an increase of ALU, the arithmetic logic units. Uh, so these are the hardware uh, pieces that can do their own ALU without any independence with other ALUs. So this makes it different than the CPU architecture mainly. They both have their own memory, etc. But here the ALU means that uh, so you can process each vertex at a different ALU. With CPU, you can like uh, make a simulation of parallelism. We call it sometimes pseudo parallel because after all, there is only one CPU, but using these context switches and you can use threads that are lightweight objects compared to the processes. So context switch of a thread is faster than the context switch of a uh, process. So given a graphics process, an algorithm, an application, you can still use process uh, threads here in CPU, but in the end, even if it is lighter weight compared to the process switch, the, the threads at a given time, you will only have one ALU and that is being used or eight ALUs uh, like uh, there is a limit on that. But here you have explicit ALUs for you, hardware level. These are physical pieces. So this is more uh, parallelism friendly. So you have an exact parallelism here, whereas in CPU you have an illusion of parallelism because after all you are using the same limited amount of resources using uh, turn by turn based uh, rotations. Here, you really have those hardware for yourselves. And this leads to like thousands of cores on a GPU versus like eight you can go as I eight. eight, eight. Um, so GPU architecture is this messy picture, which is a messier version of this obvious picture. So uh, to keep things uh, to understand things, we should focus on the pipeline at a higher level, actually, without dealing with all these buses and connections, etc. Uh, so the higher level understanding is, uh, I recently found this explanation, which was better than our explanation here, in my opinion, so I just import it here. So 
uh, what this tells is you begin with an application, like you write a code in C++ or JavaScript, whatever. This is a CPU app. It uses your CPU memory. So in a GPU, you send this, your data to GPU, which is this, your scene data. And in the GPU, you uh, transform those data, like modeling transformations, uh, and also then following by the camera transformations, followed by the canonical view volume transformations, after all these orthographic projections or perspective projections. So you have all these transformations that are carried out by this so-called vertex shader. So shader is a funny word here. Uh, it will be clear later, but this is about transforming vertices into your, all the way down to your 2D viewport. Okay, starting from the world coordinates here, you go to the camera space. So, sorry, first you do modeling transformations, you rotate your objects, scale them, etc., move them, animate them. Then in that state, you then you go to the camera coordinate system. From there, you go to the canonical view volume. And from there, you go to the viewport, 2D viewport, which is what this yellow box does uh, via vertex shader. So once you are in the 2D, you have one, two, three vertices from your scene data that, that, is, that are now on 2D. Uh, and now this is uh, your rasterizer, your rasterizer kicks in and it fragments your element. In this case, it's, it's a triangle. So it puts pixels to the inside, inside of this triangle and it already knows. Uh, so actually it sends all these fragments in addition to the one, two, three vertices that are explicitly known, it creates the inside pixels inside 2D points using rasterization algorithms, which we skipped. So I will show you those algorithms as well next week, uh, but you can essentially, you do some scan line algorithms and fill the in-betweens, like line drawing Bresenham algorithm, or triangle filling algorithms. So they, these are all, implemented in hardware level very fast. So you don't have any power here. You can't mess with this box. It is not programmable. Uh, so vertex shader is programmable like this white box shows. So once the, your fragments are ready, this output is sent to the fragment shader. Again, all these are happening inside the GPU uh, and in parallel because these are all different uh, independent actions. So each fragment here, this box, this box, this box, they find its own color value. So you do your color computation in the fragment shader. And you have a lot of options here, like tone shading, funk shading. So you can simulate your ray tracing even here. Those equations mostly apply because you fragment shader, you, already, you are already given the normals at these points after the rasterization interpolations. Yes, so that's it actually. Again, let me summarize with this picture actually, the same idea. I just put the names inside uh, and let's make this more clear. So your application needs to talk with the uh, GPU. To do that, you are using a graphics API, which will be OpenGL in our case. OpenGL talks with actually it's, compiles the vertex shader and fragment shader. Okay, so these codes, uh, so, and those codes are already in the GPU memory. We sent those codes here, they are fixed. And the variables that work within those codes are not fixed. So you sent them here explicitly, depending on your current state. So you constantly feed your shaders with uniform variables, we call them uniform because they are uniform for all the structures here. Uh, and yeah, so your code goes to the GPU memory as well as your scene data goes here. 
and you can control your code further using uniform variables. And these are the shader programs. Uh, and the graphics API is what makes the connection between CPU and GPU. So this is the high level picture of what is going on between your CPU app C++ here versus the uh, GPU. Uh, what it does here transforms, rasterizes, and colors, fragment colors. And we get this output. Actually, that is the whole point. Although we don't see any meaningful output here. So this is an output. Now let's get into the detail of, of OpenGL. OK. Uh, the user program is an OpenGL or uh, direct 3D can also be used. Uh, so these programs run on the CPU here, the black box. Uh, and all data is also in the system memory initially. So the user program is responsible to uh, send data to GPU. Again, graphics API is used for that. So now your data will be in GPU memory, which makes more sense. So GPU, all these stuff, they will get the data from its own memory rather than talking with uh, a CPU memory that is farther away from you. So that will be much slower physically. Okay, so you have to send your data to GPU using your OpenGL. Uh, and also, in addition to that, uh, you also have to open a window and manage user interaction on that window, which has nothing to do with the GPU. So you have to prepare this environment. So GPU is not responsible for that. And actually OpenGL is not even responsible for that. So there is a higher level API called GLUT or free GLUT or GLFW, graphics library framework. So we use those stuff to open a window and establish keyboard and mouth listening on that window. Uh, and then uh, you decide what to draw and when to draw. So this is the OpenGL task based on your current algorithm. And then you ask GPU to uh, compile shaders uh, that are the programs to be later run on the GPU. Now let's start from the very basic and step-by-step -step build into a full OpenGL program that is uh, using a GPU. So you first need some window around. And again, this is not a part of OpenGL. Each operating system has a different mechanism. So OpenGL doesn't bother with that. Uh, there is a high-level API, or there are high-level APIs that simplify this process. Here is my favorite one, GLUT. This is kind of old actually, currently. This is still in use, uh, maintained, but free GLUT is a good alternative to that. Or also GLFW, Graphics Library Framework, is a good alternative to that. But I will do my discussion on this GLUT that I am familiar with. You initialize, uh, you take some arguments uh, that, uh, it is about uh, uh, some text, texting, title of the window, etc. Uh, so here you are enabling double buffering. So we will see what they all mean. We are supporting. So actually, this is typical to support all these actions. Then you decide where to put the window on your screen and the size of the window to be put on the screen. Um, and there is this double buffering that is carried out uh, in the background for you. Here is the problem. So in a typical graphics application, we, application, we see 30 frames per second, like you have seen that phrase 30 FPS, that is 30 frame per second. So it is a quite extensive work to do. Uh, so with only a single buffer on the screen, like this left buffer, you see somehow the first frame, okay. 
then you if you use only one buffer single buffering then you will be rendering the next time t plus one on this buffer uh, and so you see the new version as well as the untouched versions of the buffer which will call this uh, lead to this flickering or tearing so this is something we uh, should avoid for visual uh, convenience. To do that, we use two buffers. This is the screen buffer, and this is the back background buffer. You you call it that way. So currently, the, actually, this will be the on screen buffer, and this is the background buffer. When the user sees this, uh, the next frame T plus one is built here. So with this weird uh, uh, intermediate times, but I don't see this, so no problem. When the background buffer is completed, is ready, uh, then you swap buffers. So now this becomes the on-screen buffer and this becomes the background buffer. So when you are seeing this T plus one frame here, uh, perfectly without any flickering or tearing, uh, you also start to work on T plus two frame here. And then when this is ready, you swap again, then this becomes the screen buffer and this becomes the background buffer and so on and so forth. So this action is called double buffering and it is used to prevent tearing or flickering. Here, the same thing is being described. Uh, and we, uh, OpenGL programs support this through GLUT, you call GLUT swap buffers and in the end of your rendering function. So this is something you need to do. Uh, now coming back to the program we are discussing. Now I am talking about the register. My, I am registering the callback functions that will be called whenever I hit a keyboard uh, key or whenever I do some resizing on my uh, window, like using mouse, drag and drops, et cetera. So that with these two functions, you can use any function names, obviously. So for the keyboard function, you register it here. And later, this, this is the function itself. Uh, the key hit is sent here. You can just use uh, the ASCII code of the key or just use the key as a character and then do whatever you want to do with that key value. Uh, and yeah, for left, right, we have separate special key press callbacks. And reshape function is whenever a window is displayed, like for the first time, or you went to a different application and then came back, come back to the current graphics application, or you are still in the same application, but you resize, you resize your window. Certain settings like the viewport may need to be updated, especially when you resize it, obviously you have to update it. And even if you don't resize it, you come back to that window. So you need to update the viewport again to refresh the screen. So reshape function does that. Actually what it does is, uh, so that is W and H is the current window size after the resizing. So this, this information is sent here. You don't worry about it. Uh, and you actually put your viewport to zero, zero point left, top left corner with the current W and H. And then this is now we are talking about OpenGL functions finally. So these are not GLUT functions. You see GL something is an OpenGL function, whereas GLUT something is a GLUT function. And the programming here is actually not that cool. Uh, this is state-based programming, not object-oriented programming. So see this load identity function. It obviously applies to a matrix to convert it into an identity matrix. Okay, but what matrix? So you don't see any matrix here. With an object oriented paradigm, you use matrix M1 dot load identity, but we don't have that. We change the state 
to the current matrix. So I first the, make the state matrix state, the projection state. Uh, so this is about then uh, a perspective or orthographic projection, right? So this will change your uh, matrix responsible for your viewing transformations we discussed previous week. Then you change your matrix to the model view matrix, and then any matrix related operation will affect that model view matrix. Not the, so the load identity here, it will not hurt the uh, viewing transformation matrix. The model view transformation matrix is the discussion we did two weeks ago, if you recall. It is about rotations, scaling, orientation, that stuff. And I set it to identity, not, no transformation so far, but currently the matrix mode is model view mode. So any rotation or translation, which is a matrix application, will be applied to this model view matrix, not to the projection matrix. So this is a very important thing to consider while doing OpenGL programming, kind of weird state-based programming. So it is prone to errors, but you should be aware of this uh, separation. And another uh, callback function that you need to register is this display. Uh, function so that is called whenever you need to render something so it is automatically called by the windowing system whenever required uh, so you can even tie this to a timer so it is called refreshed every 0 0.1 seconds uh, with the new coordinates etc so this display function is very cr crucial you will do all your rendering in this function so let's see what is happening? So you clear uh, the backgrounds to black, red, green, blue. These are your background colors. Okay, so this is the clear color. You just uh, you can even set this once at a different function, but here uh, you set it over and over again. Then you clear it and you render the new frame using this function that you write. Inside this function, you will do your uh, rotations, model view transformations, etc., and your uh, rendering function calls like GL, vertex, 3F, etc. And then you do this swap buffer to implement the double buffering we discussed before. So this is very crucial. At the end of your display function, you have to call this to prevent flickering, tearing. Yes, and here the animation is also possible. Like you re-display, you call your display callback repeatedly, you re, re like call it again and again. So within the idle function, I just call this and this eventually calls this because I tell my tell that my display function is called display here. Uh, and yes, okay, so then what this glut idle func does is uh, just another callback. Uh, it will be called every 0 0.1 seconds. So you also set the timer. Uh, I don't show it here, but you also set a timer for that. Uh, yeah, so that will be or even if you don't set the timer, by default, it will be called uh, like 0 0.01 seconds, every 0 0.01 seconds. So it is very uh, frequent. You can change that frequency with another function call of GLUT. Again, this is about windowing. So this is not an OpenGL function. Now let's focus on OpenGL functions. Now I am in my render frame function. So this, like this function, render frame. Uh, okay. So in this function, uh, we 
the user program must communicate the geometry information to the GPU, must send that information. Uh, so assume you want to draw a line that goes from one endpoint x0, y0, z0 to the second endpoint. So the OpenGL syntax is as follows. You have GL begin and GL end. Inside here, you specify the parameter like GL line. Then you need two GL vertex calls because two defines a line. It can be triangles. Then every three GL vertex 3F makes one triangle. So you need to use double multiples of threes just as you use multiples of twos here. Yeah, so here, for instance, same same discussion, but I am, we covered the GL begin and GL end uh, functions. Now let's see the detail about the vertex 3F functions. GL means belongs to the library, GL graphics library, library, two libraries. Vertex means the function name. And three is three dimensional. Uh, so you will expect three parameters and those parameters will be of type float. They could be double or integer. You use I here for integer, D for double, etc. And they can even be vectors. So floating point vectors, then you just put a three dimensional vector here called P. That vector is actually an array of size three. So here, uh, I change my current state, the color state to red. Then this vertex will be affected from this color. Again, I am doing color-based, state-based programming, not an object-oriented programming. So now I change the color state again to green. Uh, now the following vertex 3F calls will be affected by this call. So this will be green, not the first one though. So you will have a line that goes from red to green and everything in between are interpolated. Uh, so you don't worry about that. You just provide the endpoint colors. R your rasterizer will do the interpolation uh, as it creates the line between these two endpoints. And that rasterizer is actually inside your GPU. Uh, so it is extremely fast, hardware level implementations are there. But about the algorithm that create, finds the pixels between two endpoint pixels, we will learn those algorithms. Like the Brezhanem algorithm will be very popular here. Uh, so currently don't worry about the algorithm, just assume that rasterizer takes this input and uh, makes the line and interpolates the colors from red to green in between. Here is a different primitive. I don't want to draw, draw a line. I want to draw a triangle. So it is a plural. So you can draw any number of triangles within this begin and end block, but currently I will draw only one. So I need to provide three GL vertex 3F calls. They will all be the same color because this, whatever the current color state is, it applies to all these three. Uh, so every group of three vertices define a triangle using GL triangle uh, model. If you want to draw two triangles, then you have to, uh, this first row will be your first triangle. So indentation doesn't matter actually. Then comes your fourth, fifth, and sixth calls for the second triangle. There can be some efficiency tricks here. So instead of using, uh, GL triangles, which is effectively replicating this data, right? So you draw 0, 1, 2, then you draw 1, 3, 2. So 1 and 2 are called twice here. So maybe once here, once here, etc. with triangles. So strip is, a, is an efficient solution for that. Actually, what you do is first three makes one triangle, then this guy makes the next triangle using the last two points, last two vertices. Then if you use another guy, it will be the 
next triangle using that new guy plus this plus this. Okay, so that's why you reduce your number of calls because each of these calls get executed in the CPU. So they take CPU time. Even if you have multiple threads, you can't really give a different thread to each point, assuming you have like thousands of points in a regular typical mesh 3D model. So these are, they all need to be executed on the CPU. So they need to acquire the CPU and do whatever it does. Uh, then this goes away and this vertex call comes to the CPU again. So after all, if you have only one CPU at any given time, you can execute only one of these functions. So these are CPU functions then. Uh, uh, we don't really want to do that in an efficient uh, graphics program. We use vertex shaders for our transformations, etc., uh, in parallel in GPU. So this is like an old uh, paradigm, but still, uh, after all, these are very fast functions, so it may not be that critical, but the correct way to do is to import everything here to GPU. Uh, yeah, okay, so triangle strip is like that. Uh, so you have, you have to be careful about the ordering. Zero, two, one. Again, using your right hand side rule, your, your right hand, zero to two, you point your right hand towards that, then you bend it towards one. Then your thumb sticks inside the screen. Then one, two, three, again, sticks inside the screen. If you starting a right hand, looking from one to two, then bend it towards three. So your normals must be compatible. Yeah, so the AP. Yok değilim dersi. Uh, so, yes, in this slide, we talk about the state machine architecture of the OpenGL, uh, which is not a very good architecture in my opinion, but anyway, so you, various states are preserved until we change them. So there is no object around. You just have this global state and like color set is green, then everything below is green, etc. But at some point, you may want to change the color of this vertex of this triangle. Then you have to explicitly change the color of the entire state, etc. Uh, and by the way, not just colors. You can also specify normals for the vertices. You can comp compute your normals or let the OpenGL find the normal. Uh, for you using the connectivity, but here you provide the normal based on your calculations, hopefully a correct normal. Yes, OpenGL is then a state machine. Uh, and OpenGL functions have two responsibilities. One for primitive generation using GL begin and GL end stuff. Uh, where your primitives can be lines, triangles, quads, etc. And OpenGL is also responsible for state changing. Like I am talking about model view transformations. So change the matrix state to the model view or color attribute state or weaving state, etc. Uh, here is a complete program actually, just like. Uh, 10 lines of code or something. What this does is it gives you this 2D quad on your screen uh, by first creating the window with the title simple here. Uh, and then you call your display function. You, you tell that my display function is this. And then you go get into this main loop, which is ready to call this my display. Actually, it, it calls it once and then depending on the configuration, may call it again. 
in the my display function, you clear the background to black in this case, then you begin a polygon. So this is even more flexible. You uh, don't have to use a triangle or quad with polygon uh, until it ends, it creates the polygon. Uh, in this case, it will be foregone with four vertices, a quad. Uh, so you provide those words directly. Then you end it and you flush it, like tell the buffer uh, to display itself. Uh, a complete sample code. So every OpenGL program must have a display callback, which is my display in this case. The display callback is executed whenever OpenGL decides that the display must be refreshed. Yeah, which is the case that happens during opening or resizing. Uh, and main function ends with the entire program entering an event loop. So here we expect events like resizing events or keyboard events. So that's why we, we are in a loop. We don't just quit the main. Otherwise, the program finishes. Um, now, I will improve on this program a little bit. Currently, this is a very default initialization. We can state things like size of the window, which is not the case here. So you tell GLUT to create this size. Uh, and obviously, you need to include GLUT first. Uh, and the loop, so this is the same display function, same idea, init. In the init, again, this is called only once. You don't have to call it over and over again. So you tell that my clear color, so whenever I call uh, GL clear, this will use that color state, okay? Clear color. So it will be the black, it will be black and it will not be transparent. One is opaque, zero is transparent. Uh, and the current color, so whatever you will draw will be white as we see here. Uh, you set the projection to an orthographic projection with this uh, left bottom, top, uh, left, right, top, bottom, near, far values. Uh, so it specifies the weaving volume. And the units of uh, GI vertex are determined by the application. So these are the word coordinates. Uh, as you do your model weave transformations, they change. But initially, we are talking about word coordinates. Uh, and the weaving specifications are also in word coordinates, and it is the size of the weaving volume that determines what will appear in the image. Uh, and OpenGL will convert the word coordinates. Actually, let me tell model coordinates because after you apply model weave transformations like rotations and scaling, they will change, but they will still be in your own understanding, in your own world coordinate uh, system. OpenGL using your uh, parameters, projection parameters here, it converts it to camera coordinates and then it also converts it further to viewport screen coordinates through the transformations we have studied last week. So OpenGL camera uh, is this what you expect is this by default. The, it places the camera at the origin and it points in the negative Z direction. Okay, so this is your regular XYZ uh, Cartesian coordinate frame and your camera looks into the negative Z. So it looks inside the screen like towards this back plane, far plane. Default weaving volume is a box centered at the origin with a side of length two from minus one to one, minus one to one, etc. In the default orthographic view, points are projected forward along the z axis onto the 
z equal to zero plane. So that would be uh, this plane in gray. Yeah, you essentially get rid of the z component and you just keep the x, y of the 3D point. So this point will be just here in the orthographic mode. Uh, so you can change that mode here. We are talking about this orthographic mode with side lengths of two, minus one to one, minus one to one, minus one to one. Uh, so in GL ortho, we are specifying the left, right, bottom, top, and near far parameters of your viewing volume, measured distance from the camera. Uh, and if the application is in 2D, then you don't worry about the near far at all. Uh, so these, these coordinates parameters are used for clipping the clipping out the stuff outside your uh, view for us. Now the states, color states, uh, uh, the colors as set by GI color becomes part of the state and will be used until king. Uh, colors and other attributes are not part of the object, so not object-oriented programming, but are assigned when the object is rendered. So this is kind of weird and old-fashioned, but this is what it is in OpenGL. Uh, and conceptually, to render each vertex with a different color, you have to first call the GL color, then GL vertex. So all these calls, again, they go to CPU, so they take uh, time at least some context which time, some overheads included. So these are uh, to be avoided actually. Uh, and OpenGL interpolates vertex colors across polygons. So in this case, the polygon has green, blue, yellow, and red vertices. You just provide those four colors and it interpolates everything inside if you are in the GL smooth mode. Again, you change the state of the shape model, not the matrix model, but shape model to smooth. GL flat, it uses the color of one vertex and uses that color everywhere inside. And that would be the viewport. Actually, if this is your entire screen, viewport starts from XY coordinate, the top uh, bottom left corner and it goes width and height W and H amounts in horizontal and vertical directions. Uh, yeah, so again, here I am talking about a different application. It is not that important, actually, this is a fractal application. It is just interesting from this fact, actually, although the area goes to zero as you subdivide each triangle with this rule, like get rid of the inside and keep the three top left and right. As you do it for further and further, the area goes to zero. So you see whites all the way, uh, but the perimeter goes to infinity. So just the home fact, this is a different, interesting fractal, but we don't worry about that geometric detail now. As far as its implementation goes, so how to get this on the screen, starting from this triangle? You have your main, so you will do four level of subdivisions. Uh, then you do your initialization only once, and then you let the display function do your work. Again, it will be called at any event, like if the scene is resized or you come back to this screen later. So this main loop waits for those events. But even without those events, it will be called at least once, which will give you this output, hopefully. And to get that into your display function, you call your divide triangle, a recursive call using this original point. It actually uh, creates new points. Uh, and using the midpoints of the edges. Uh, so it creates new triangles and all. And in the end, 
let's talk about the, the, the drawing. Uh, the, the drawing does the following. Okay, so the triangle function actually makes the drawing. So when you when your recursion goes on on and on, in the end, whenever recursions finish, we land into this drawing function called triangle based on the current ABC, whatever it is. Uh, and this function is essentially given three points. It just puts the vertices. Yeah. Uh, so I draw a lot of triangles. Actually, all these black triangles I draw explicitly in the end of the recursion using this fact. So as far as graphics programming goes, this is a very simple application. I just separate this GL begin and end into a different function. And it can even be done using tetrahedron subdivision, but same idea. So here, actually, what I want to comment is the following. I want to talk about hidden surface removal. Uh, method called Z buffering, which we have seen last week. So this is the application of this in OpenGL. Uh, so let me first show you the problem. So this is your scene data, one, two, three, four columns, followed by a floor. So if you draw it in that order, since you draw the floor last, it will go like this, which is terrible. Because in this case, I don't do any depth test, I just, draw by order. But here, even if you draw this at last, since the depth best that buffering is enabled, it doesn't draw it. So actually what it does is for this pixel, like this pixel, there is two candidates. There are two candidates, the green column candidate and the white floor candidate. So remember the that buffering algorithm in your viewport, not just these to the x, y coordinates, you also have the z viewport value between zero and one. So for this pixel, since the original 3D value of the green uh, is closer to you, its viewport z will also be closer to you and to zero. So you will keep that green color, not the white. So, and you all you need to do is uh, tell OpenGL to enable the depth test. And uh, again, in the very beginning, the lot you tell your windowing API that I will be using Z buffering and you enable it. That's it actually. There is also this thing you need to set. So these are just copy paste items actually. We put this in every OpenGL program. Uh, and I am about to finish actually. Now I will tie all these actions into GPU. Okay, uh, so all these previous actions sent the data using GL vertex calls. And as I mentioned before, each GL vertex call is, is executed on the CPU. And the corresponding data is then sent to GPU after the CPU works on that GL vertex call. It produces a data and that data is sent to GPU uh, and GPU does the rasterization accordingly. But the problem is you occupy your CPU for each vertex separately, okay? Which sucks basically. It is not uh, optimal, ideal, uh, because all these vertices are independent units, so they can just work on their own. So they don't have to occupy the CPU. Even if you have threads, it gives you uh, they give you illusion of parallelism. After all, at any given time, only one thread is on the CPU. Uh, that's why all these GL vertex calls, we don't like that. We should avoid them. A better approach would be to send all the vertex data to the GPU using a single call, like send the data from your CPU memory to GPU memory, and then let the GPU work on the transformations, etc. So these are, that's what vertex arrays are for. So in OpenGL, so this is still CPU programming. In my OpenGL C++ function uh, program, I tell 
about the data, I tell the GPU about my data. Uh, so to do that, I use this uh, vertex array, vertex position array in this case. It can be also color array, normal array, etc. But let's focus on the position array. Number of coordinates per vertex, that will be three, right? In 3D application. Type of each coordinate, like float or double. Stride, byte offset between consecutive vertices. This is zero, as they just follow each other uh, directly. And pointer, this is important. This is the pointer to the all vertex data. So this data in CPU memory will be transferred to the GPU memory. And to do that, we first, again, using a different TL function, we enable uh, vertex array. So we tell that we have that. And then we, so this is the order you implemented. You tell about your vertex array, then you provide it. P vertex would be the actual data, here it is. So here in this application, I have three vertices. Each has three dimensions. So first vertex, second vertex, and third vertex being zero, zero, 001. So in modern OpenGL, actually, uh, we don't explicitly use like vertex array, etc. Uh, we just uh, use a generic attribute function, very similar. So this part is similar, like size, type, stride, pointer, the actual data. But here, index is so, so what kind of array you are using? Is it a vertex? position array, vertex color array, vertex normal array, etc. So similarly, you enable it. And then, so only the red part is new. You tell that you will have a uh, vertex array. And so zero, it's, there is no reason. We just like submitting words on stream zero. So the important part is if you use zero here, you must use zero here as well as you tie this here. Uh, with the three floats and zero and vertex array, etc. And this normalize is in general, we don't do normalization, but it's also available. Uh, okay, so we use a single draw call to draw using vertex arrays. Uh, so, how to do that? I have all this vertex data, but I need triangulation. How to make triangles out of that data. For that, I now sent the triangulation data using indices to the GPU as well. Here I use GL draw elements. Uh, again, so I have a complete example here, good. So I will be using triangles to connect the vertex array, position array, and there will be 36 triangles and the indices to be connected, I, they will be of type short, like unsigned short. There won't be any negative indices. So for the efficiency, you can use unsigned. Uh, and that's it actually. So in draw elements, so based on this indices array, you will make the connections. Actually, it will be clear in this complete example. Uh, here, all the registration of callbacks in its scene, so when it comes to render scene, so where am I doing render scene? Okay, so the uh, render scene will be called on an event like in the opening case. Here, I load, again, the matrix mode is model view currently. So this is model view matrix. I translate all the vertex coordinates to minus two, minus two, and minus two to 22. Like I display all the vertex coordinates by this vector, then scale them. Uh, and that would be the first cube. Uh, then I load, I cancel all the previous transformations here, load identity, and define a different set of transformations. And that will be a different cube. Uh, so in the draw cube then, huh, okay, sorry. So the, 
you can just keep them as call lists, but assume that after you set your uh, transformations, you can now go to your draw cube uh, and specify your vertex array, which is pad PT and your vertex index. So here I am, my elements will be quads, meaning that every four will make one quad. So six, uh, so the seventh, third, fourth, and eighth element here, uh, seventh uh, is this, seventh, uh, fourth, uh, third, and eighth, last element. So they make one quad. Then the next four makes another quad, this another, this another, this another, and final quad will be of five, five, seven, five, four, six. Yeah, so using this indices array, which is the indices array here I talked about, you can now make the connection uh, in the GPU. So compare this vertex array cube drawing. Notice that, so the important point here is the following. There is no GL vertex 3F call here, right? For the drawing of cube, I don't do any GL vertex call uh, because those transformations uh, and drawing will be done in GPU. However, with the old school version of the uh, function, you have to like seven, five, four, six, the, for the first quad, you have to call four GL vertex. Then the second quad, fourth quad, fifth quad. So how many, you have four times number of quads, amount of GL vertex calls, and also some coloring quads. So you are occupying GPU, a CPU a lot with this version. Whereas here it is, you are pushing everything to the GPU. But now, let me be complete. These are vertex arrays. Actually, uh, you uh, do the following here. When using client-side vertex arrays, the vertex attribute data is copied from the system memory to the GPU at every draw call. So here, at every draw call render scene, you send all this data like vertex data and the indices data to the GPU, which is again inefficient uh, to, at every draw call. There is a better alternative known as vertex buffer. So you do this sending only once. Okay, that is the idea here in this last uh, paradigm I will talk about. So here, this is the current situation. When, whenever you see vertex pointer call, which is for your vertex, array, remember here, vertex pointer call or vertex array. Then we made it using attributes, but it is the same thing. So with every vertex pointer call, you go from system memory to GPU memory. Now, finally, in this two or three slides, I will talk about VBO, vertex buffer objects, not vertex arrays. Uh, Previous methods required by the data to be copied uh, from the system memory to GPU memory at each draw, yes, as we mentioned. VBOs are designed to allow this copy to take place only once. The copied data is reused, reused at each draw. So here is the systematic for this kind of programming. To use vertex buffer objects, we generate two buffers. One is about vertex positions or colors like floating point uh, values in general typical. And one is about indices, like integer indices to connect to make primitives. So attribute buffer and index buffer, you generate buffers. Uh, and then you bind the, uh, these buffers uh, to arrays buffer and element array buffer. Uh, and then the crucial part is you provide the content here using attribute pointer and integer index pointer. So these are the uh, real data, the pointers to those arrays, to the first elements of those arrays. Uh, and 
before drawing, we can sp specify an offset, an offset into our buffers. It is accomplished by the same function as before, uh, like this function. But this time, pointer indicates a byte offset into our buffer. OK, so that is the difference. Uh, and the same offset goes for indices. So we, uh, here I'm talking about color buffer, etc. same idea. But for, for a complete example, let's see this uh, version then. Uh, I have my vertex attribute buffer. And here is the beginning of it, which is here. Uh, and then the corresponding index buffer that will create primitives from that data. Uh, and you are sending them only once to the GPU. Then GPU works on as usual. Uh, and performance comparison is shown here. So you can achieve 100 frames per second using VBOs. Whereas if you use uh, the client side vertex array version, it will be only 20 frames per second. So this is five times faster than the above one. Therefore, almost all modern games use vertex buffer objects for drawing complex models. And actually for the GL vertex version, it will be even slower than this draw element version, but I don't even take that into consideration. Okay, so let, let's finish this class with uh, some, uh, with, uh, actually there are more stuff than I uh, so, thought about. Actually, I'm talking about the model with transformations here. So to keep things, er, to keep everything in one, video uh, let me also go through this stuff quickly as quick as possible so here actually this is just showing you some further window link functions actually this is glu function like not glut open gl function this is about playing with your view frustum viewing volume so field of view angle see the difference it is actually controlling this angle between the red, uh, the lines and the image plane. Uh, so I can change that, which effectively changes the output here. For the aspect ratio, we generally keep one, uh, should as it matches with the viewport, but if you use a different aspect ratio, you get this effect. Uh, and near plane, I can, I am playing with the near plane now, make it closer and not. And far plane is about the backside. So transformations in OpenGL then. So we kind of see, saw these functions. Now let me just put them in visual action here. In classic OpenGL, transformations are performed using translate F, rotate F, and scale F, or F can be other types, obviously. So these commands affect the current model view matrix. Therefore, the current matrix should be set as GL model view before calling these commands. And angles are in degrees, etc. Uh, transformations apply in the reverse order, just like we studied them. So if you are going to apply them to a cube, then it will be first scaled, then rotated, then translated. Uh, and they keep affecting the current matrix using the homogeneous coordinates in the background. You can compose transformations as we studied. So actually it all uh, affects the current matrix. So it puts it into, a, into the composed accumulated version. If you want to draw an object at the same position at each frame, you need to reset the matrix to identity. So start everything from the beginning. That's why this load identity is very important. You shouldn't miss this. Uh, otherwise, everything accumulates. So all the previous seconds inter, uh, transformations. So everything, they just disappear. You can't find it. You think that 
there is a bug in your code, but actually all you did is to forget about this identity load. And assume we have an object at this point, okay, red object, 004. Uh, so this is a left-hand coordinate system. After this function, what it does is you have a 90 degree rotation around Y axis. So it's like rotates here all the way, it comes here. Then you translate it uh, further in Z direction, in right direction, five more units. Uh, now imagine applying the opposite to the camera. So, uh, okay, so you can get the same effect by just applying the uh, transformations to the camera. So the object position with respect to the camera is exactly the same in these two cases. Okay, so actually here, my point is to show you how these functions uh, work. And there are uh, even more examples on my website, uh, like toy examples that do, does, that do all these transformations in OpenGL. So I recommend you to visit that as well. Uh, and with that, I finish. And uh, next week, we will do shaders, the GPU programming. We kind of discuss programmable uh, feature of the vertex shader and fragment shader. And uh, next week, we will learn how to program them using their own programming language called GLSL. But this week was about OpenGL, and this is a good point to stop. Yeah. <sighs>